I always like to start from the beginning. So, because I think great stories start from start from the beginning. So, yes. um, I wanted to ask you, uh, how did music get into your life? So, ever since I was a, a young kid, my mom has always been involved in music. And um, when she was in her 20s, she dated a musician that was, uh, that was pretty big at his time. He would uh, do support for Van Morrison, Ry Cooter, Joe Cocker, which were big names in, in his time. So she always told me these stories about like the shows they would do and and everything. So I always thought it was so cool. And um, uh, like he's he's like family to me, even though it was like from before I was born. And um, so, yeah, that's how it started. When I was in university, I worked in a dive bar. We always had rock shows going on, like tiny little local bands that would come play. And um, so that was like my my introduction to it. Mm -hmm. Did you have like any kind of like musical, I don't know, education or something like that? Did you play any instruments? No, <laughs> I've, I've played a tiny little bit of guitar, but that was at a later stage and I never really got through with it. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and how did you like start uh, working in, in the industry or like uh, maybe having some kind of like interest for uh, having a professional career in the music industry? Yeah, when I was in university, I never really knew what I wanted to do. So I changed major a couple times and uh, I ended up finishing something that I've never worked in, uh, human resources. Uh, I don't like it necessarily, but I have my paper and that was something that I just needed to have. And um, so I started working in events uh, first for Blizzard Entertainment, which is a, a video game company, a United States company, but I worked in Paris. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands, so it wasn't too far from home, and I already lived there. You've been all, all over the place. <laughs> yes. I lived in France for seven years. Uh, I studied there, and then I stayed for work, did other events first, and then for Blizzard, and that was really cool because I was working on the production side and we had multi-million dollar shows and it was very big and they have a lot of budget and you can do a lot of crazy things and it was a, a really cool environment too like the people are amazing so that definitely got me started uh, in events but after a couple years I was like it's only one off shows that we do we don't tour so you do all the work and then you do this one huge show and then you go home and you do everything again. And I was like, man, I wish I could have a routine and just keep going yeah. so it gets, yeah, easier. And um, so that's when I was like, I want to do something else that makes me travel more, like further away, because I was only in Europe and um, the United States had their own events team. So I was like, what can I do? And I was like, I'd love to do like touring. But I didn't know what. Like I have no background, I have no connections. So I started just doing research and um, uh, yeah, I, I found out by research online that you can't just apply for a job and you have to know people. And there was also so much and I didn't know like lighting or sound or video. Like I had no background in that. So I was like, I don't know what I can do. And the only thing I knew was kind of production from the video games, which is different, but also has like some similarities. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I started Googling people and uh, looking for advice, thinking like someone could like point me at least in the right direction. And um, mm -hmm. that's how I found Jake Berry, who I didn't know how big he was <laughs> at the time that I found his name because otherwise I would have never been able to call him. I would be so nervous. I was already so nervous to call him in the first place. And um, so I called him, I explained to him what I wanted to do. And, um, and he was like, you know what? Why don't you come shadow me for a day? And I was like, wow, that would be so amazing. I can like ask him all these questions. I brought a notebook with me and I had so much to ask. And um, he was in Paris with you two in the stadium. Okay. And um, he actually followed through and uh, got me to shadow him. And I ended up staying a week with them. 
uh, took off from work for a week to, to spend time with him. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, he introduced me to uh, Pascal Lar, who was uh, the Live Nation France local production manager. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's how it started, really. Wow. It's amazing. It's amazing how you started like Googling, like you didn't have any idea of like anything. You didn't have any contact inside the industry mm -hmm. at all. No. So you just went into Google and you were like, I'm going to find the telephone of this guy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. I saw his like resume online and I was like, wow, this guy has seen everything. Like if anybody can give me a good advice on where to start or what to do, it should be this guy. And he was so nice to me. I was like a nobody, I had no connections, no experience in the music industry. And he was just the nicest person. I was so surprised how nice everybody has been really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes I guess, uh, especially when we are emerging professionals or like, like me or my friends who are probably the, the audience of this, uh, of this show, um, we have that feeling that we cannot email anyone, like we cannot text them. We're like, they are like another level. We cannot get in touch with them. Exactly. And surprisingly, like they are super nice. They're there to help. They, they're always willing, like willing to help us and give us advice and everything. And, and, and I've learned that through this show. So like through Live versus Live. But before that, I was like, no way I'm texting that person. Like they are way too far away from me. <laughs> Oh yeah, I was so nervous to call him too and uh, I remember sitting in my car and telling myself like I'm not going to drive off before I call this person because I kept postponing it and going like oh he's probably going to think I'm crazy or you know I'm going to just get a no and that's it you know mm -hmm. and uh, he was the nicest person and that really got me started off right. Yeah, no definitely I mean who better you can start with than <laughs> Barry. I know that now. I didn't know that then. <laughs> but that's the, that's, the, that's the funniest thing that you didn't know. You were just like messaging a guy like, yeah, hi, how are you? And it's Jake Barry, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. uh, well, and uh, you start like, I wanted to talk a bit about the video games industry as well, because it's huge. I, to be honest, I don't have any idea about it. I'm not a gamer myself. I, the only play the like the only video games I've ever played were like probably Pokemon, Animal Crossing, and Mario Bros. That's it. <laughs> yeah. So I so I'm super always I'm super amazed by the, the the events that the video games company like put on. Like so, how how does this work? Is it the same like similar to the music industry or? It's very similar, especially the consumer events and the esports competitions. Uh, it has a big stage. We even had like uh, big bands playing on our stages too, like musical bands for entertainment. Um, the production behind it is similar, except there is a lot more scenery and nothing tours. So it's only built for these one shows. So everything gets thrown away after that. So that's kind of a different like approach. Uh, when you tour, you want to make sure that everything lasts and it will get on the road and it's easy to install and doesn't stall and the load ins and load outs have to go fast. And for the video game shows, we had a week to load a show in and like, like everything else after that, like the things that we would take was maybe two trucks that we would take back home and like the computers and everything would go back to the vendors. It was all like uh, rentals. So all that would just go back and we had a lot of sponsors so all that stuff just goes back to to them and yeah it's it's a lot more like for touring you want to recycle everything and bring it and make sure it lasts and for the video game shows you just wanted to work for that one show and that's it mm -hmm. and so that's a different it? different approach and they have a lot more money they don't care about ticket sales <laughs> they it's all just, you know, like, especially Blizzard, uh, they only have six games. That's their thing. And they're big and they sell themselves. They don't have, need a lot of marketing. They don't need a lot of, uh, like, they don't really care. Like, tickets are usually either free or a few bucks just to get, like, an, an, a name on an entrance. Um, yeah. But my cat's here. <laughs> She's, like, walking oh, through the... God, hi. I love when we have this kind of guests in the conversation. I love it. 
so yeah so she uh, so that's like that's a big difference like they don't care as much about making money and it's all about an image uh getting some media exposure uh you can justify anything uh on that show as long as it gets media exposure so that's what what it's focused on more yeah and how is the the impact changing from um the, the video games industry when you are just doing one one event you have a time like two weeks to to load in like everything is super chill in that sense to go directly into touring when everything is like super fast speed so how how did you feel like how did you feel in that moment um i did like it because um i think the pressure of getting it ready makes people work together better because everybody wants to get the show on the road or uh, load it in. Um, so I did like the teamwork of it. Everybody has their own, their own little world, their own part, but everybody works together. And I think in the video game industry, it wasn't as much like you would have one day where one company would build the stage and then they would leave. And then the next day lighting would come in. So you didn't really have to work together to make it get up, like load in fast. And everybody had more time to do just their thing. Um, so it was, I think the departments were more separated just because you had more time to do it. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Yeah, I understand. Um, and uh, well, uh, talking a bit about um, how, like, because you talked about how Jake, um, Jake Berry just uh like he was super nice to you at first like he was uh really welcoming and and he didn't really mind if you had any experience if you knew anyone it's like he just took you under his wing and then he um he taught everything or most things that that you wanted to know uh, in that specific week uh, that you worked with him so uh how important do you think it is to have someone at the beginning that trust you that believes in you uh and that who who like who, who actually acts acts like a mentor i guess yeah i think it's very important because it was so overwhelming and i still thought at the start that i was going to be in production because that was what i thought i knew at least some of it um so that's why i wanted to shadow him and his uh, tour coordinator or like his production coordinator and assistant. I wanted to know what they were doing. And um, so that's what I thought at first, but then he said like, try everything. Just, you know, there's so many different aspects of it. So that's when he introduced me to the local production manager, uh, Pascal. And he was like, you know, why don't you just become a stagehand for a while and see if you like it uh see what what's going on what it takes because he said even as a production manager or production coordinator you need to know what's going on on the stage you need to know like what the whole organization is not just that one part like a lot of people that are now production managers they started either in lighting or in sound or somewhere else they didn't start in production so um, that's like, I talked to Pascal and Pascal's like, yeah, you can be a stagehand. I'll hire you. And, um, so I, I was a stagehand for a while in Paris in the stadium and in the arenas that they had there. And, um, Pascal, I, I think a lot to him too, because he always gave me opportunities to, uh, to stay longer and I would work for free, like all the time, because I would have to work like maybe 10 or 12 hours, like paid. But there is always like a show call where the people stay, like some stagehand can stay for the show. And even if I wasn't part of that group, uh, he would give me a pass so I could still stay. Because I figured out if I was uh, part of maybe 50 stagehands in the beginning of the day, it's really hard to stand out. But if there's only five left at the end of the day, it's a lot easier to talk to people. So every like show that was there i would try to stay as long as i could and even like beyond my paid hours just to meet people and bug people and that's kind of how i met Faye. yeah uh, because i would just randomly if i had a, like a quiet moment i would walk into the production office and go like hi i want to learn about this and i have questions for you and then they would be like all right i'll have i'll have a minute for you i'll talk to you and um so 
yeah, so I would talk to the, all the production managers that I could just to ask them questions and see what they what they thought, you know, I should do in certain situations or how they started. I wanted to know everybody's story. And, um, yeah. and a lot of people have been very supportive over the years and stayed in touch and I would stay in touch with them. And uh, so it was really cool as well that I met Faye again uh, two years, like a year and a half ago for uh, my last tour I was on, Ricky Martin that he was the production manager and I could actually like work for him as an automation That's operator, amazing. which is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so your paths cross again. Yes, exactly. And that was so cool. I was so happy that I heard that he was going to be the production manager for that tour. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, well, and now that we maybe are talking about um, like more uh, like your professional career, so like your skills and, and, um you um so i've read the the article that you sent to me is brilliant i really like it and you. uh you, no worries so uh you are an automation and um i i know it by the day from the top of my head i know it an automation operator and programmer eh? yeah. <laughs> exactly. so tell me a bit about this so um what it, does it mean to be an automation operator like what do you guys do on tour. So automation is a department where um, we we have moving scenery, mostly a lot of the things are rigged. So we'll have winches or smart chain motors in the roof and we'll have lifts on the stage or treadmills or you know basically anything that can, can move. Uh, those are uh, computer uh, operated. So I have software on a laptop that I can control the machines with. Mm -hmm. um, so during the show, when an artist comes up on a lift, uh, I'm the one that uh, programs the, the speed of it and that will actually press the button to make the, the artist move. And you have a former flying tube, for example, things like that. So you are the person, if the artist falls down, <laughs> you're probably the one who has the responsibility on that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm the one being yelled at in the production office if something goes wrong. <laughs> oh my god! No, to be honest, I think it's amazing. Like, I think one of the, uh, I think one of one of the first gigs that I saw, it was not so long ago when I saw uh, the artist um, fly over the the stadium. It was in BTS. So one of the was one of the singers was flying all over the place, and and this, the lady, like all the kids were screaming, and it was amazing. And it was like I found it incredible, like how, how, how we've changed, like how technology has changed so far in like twenty years, because that was seemed like that was not possible to do back in the time. Right. So um, how how At fast? Least not safe. <laughs> no, exactly. It was not. I mean, you could do it, but. <laughs> You can hang some off a chain motor and fly down, but <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or the artist could just like jump into the crowd, like and and so yeah, crowd surfing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, how how um, since the moment that you started until now, I know like you know you haven't been in a career of like forty years, like Faye or Jake, but. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that you've seen many changes in, in, in the technologies of automation and all of that, because you, you said that it develops really fast. It changes a lot. So what kind of changes like have you seen in the last few years? I think especially safety wise, things are getting a lot safer because technology is getting smarter. So um, instead of things just stopping because it doesn't work, you have more alarms, more sensors. Uh, weight sensors, um, like moving sensors. There's a lot of things that you can add to your equipment now that didn't exist mm -hmm. years ago to make it uh, safer for the operator. Yeah. Um, there's more camera views. Cameras are getting cheaper, so it's easier for the production to add cameras on the back of lifts and things like that to make sure that I can see what's going on from front of house. I usually operate from front of house so I can see all the yeah. things in the air because there is not just lifts. There is also a lot of things that are rigged in the air that move. Yeah. So that gives me a good overview so I can see if something goes wrong. Uh, I can see what's going on on the stage. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, the rest great. of the crew will, will be at the back of the stage uh, 
giving me indications during the show. So you're practically connected to every single walkie talkie like on behind the stage, like everyone's telling you, yeah, this is this is going right or this is gonna go yes. really wrong or <laughs> exactly. Usually yeah. uh, we work with Clearcom, which is a communication system where you can talk over each other, which is safer than uh, radios. Because yeah. uh, with the radios, if one person talks, the other one can't. So if one person is talking and someone else has to yell stop because something goes wrong, I can't hear both of them. So it's always okay, that's, more yeah. dangerous. To, uh, yeah. Clearcom, if someone yells stop, it will come through no matter what. Mm -hmm. And how do you know what to stop? <laughs> because maybe if like someone just yells stop, then everything will stop. Mm -hmm yeah everything stops <laughs> everything stops if someone just yells stop like something is going really bad usually you know you'll know if like a lift is going and that's the thing that's moving and then someone yells stop you know it's the lift so you can just stop the lift and not like the winches that are moving in the air um but i have a really big red button that's my e-stop and it's oh, always right goodness. next to me so if someone yells stop i press that button and everything, like everything in the in the everything stage. stops. That's amazing. You have the power, literally. Yeah. <laughs> you have to because if someone is stuck in a lift or something, or their foot stuck or something, if someone fell, uh, you know, someone's not attached properly. If you have to attach them to uh, equipment, like uh, yeah, it has to be safe. So I always rather have like something not move the way that we plan it to. The audience usually doesn't even see it because they don't know what to expect. So if a, something is late or like, we will see it and it will annoy us. But after like at the end, we're going to be like, oh yeah, it was the right, right thing to do to stop it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And have you ever had um, an experience where every like something went wrong and you had to use that button? I've never had to press the e stop during the show, but I've had to. Um, we've had to delay the opening of the show because some of my machines weren't responding, and I had to reset certain things before we could start. So we had to play the intro again. Uh, things like that, you know, like you're already everything is black, and then my machines yeah. just everything goes red, and you're like, oh no, <laughs> I have to start <laughs> right now. And you go like, guys, play the intro again. I need another. 10 seconds and then you have to see if you can make it go like at the time and so they would play the intro again and we just it would work yeah yeah there's a really good point there that you said um that the audience doesn't really know what's going to happen so i exactly. think that plays in your favor yes absolutely like if a lift doesn't go up on a certain song because it's broken something went wrong like the machine doesn't want to do it there's a power problem the audience doesn't know and as long as someone can talk to the artist and the dancers that they know that it's not gonna happen that day then they'll like work with it usually and uh, yeah we don't we don't know we know it so it and it annoys us that it didn't go perfectly a show but the audience doesn't know yeah I remember this time uh, there was this time I went to uh, the O2 arena I think in London I was um, I was invited to go see a little mix and they had a problem with the lift so but what we actually realized because they got stuck I think in the middle or something like that they couldn't go up some I, I don't know something went wrong with the lift and the audience realized because they had to stop the whole show I don't know what happened there but they had to like stop the show for a couple of minutes and then they continued. I don't know what was going on, but everyone was like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, we had that with Spice Girls in the, in the stadium in, the, mm -hmm. uh, in London as well. Uh, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was terrible because it was the first night there and everybody was so hyped for this big show. Mm -hmm. And um, we all were like, hyped for it and then one of our our main stage big lift it actually consisted out of six different separate lifts that were supposed to be used separately but they decided they only wanted to use it as one platform um we had an issue with one of the lifts thinking it was at the same height as the other lifts but it was not and so it was always lower than the rest of the lifts 
And so at some point I kept faulting it because it kept, they were all attached to each other. So that one lift that didn't work properly kept pulling on the other lifts and the other lifts were like, well, something is wrong. So it stopped oh all the God. time. So we had to stop using that lift for the rest of the show, which is pretty mm -hmm. major. Uh, and obviously it was the only night that there was like the, the crew party. So we missed the crew party because we were fixing oh. the lift. And uh, so we found out what the issue was and it was luckily it was something we could fix, but um, we did have to decide during that show after a couple of faults with the lift to stop mm -hmm. using it during that particular show. Luckily we had mm -hmm. three shows there in the Wembley Stadium. Um, well, that's but, good, yeah. Yeah, so that was something that was really major and that was something that um, I got called in the production office straight after that show finished and like what's going on I'm like I don't know yet I'm gonna have to look at it <laughs> they were like why didn't it work I was like if I knew that <laughs> I probably would have been able to fix it yeah it tried to fix things like during the show change cables like maybe it's the cable that's wrong power problem mm -hmm. maybe it's like something else so you try to like a different drive so you try to mm -hmm. like do everything that you can do during the show to try to fix it but yeah. if it keeps giving you the same problem, you have to like choose for uh, safety and, and stop. Yeah. yeah, exactly. No, definitely always safety, safety first. <laughs> safety is always a big thing. And it's always something that is not always uh, agreed on at like, especially during rehearsals when you're like, mm, I don't know if this is safe, let's hold off. And they go like, well, we want to do this right now. And you're like, let's not do this right now. Let's see if we can make happen safely mm -hmm. and um so that's something definitely like safety is is the big thing with automation mm -hmm. yeah definitely you're basically putting people in the air and 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 throwing loads of things <laughs> and putting people up and down in a lift so yes. yeah <laughs> yes you don't want anybody to fall off or you know anything like happen to mm -hmm. it or to the crew or to the band or yeah. dancer whoever is involved mm -hmm, definitely well and and talking about the process because uh, you were mentioning rehearsals so uh how long do you need to prepare a show like like a tour like the spice girls tour or for rick and martin and things like that so it usually starts already at home um we get uh like i get a request for a certain tour and then you get some information on what kind of machines we're going to use what what's the equipment going to be like so I go um, to that company, the staging company that's hired for that tour. So uh, for Spice Girls, that was brilliant stages in the UK. Um, but for Ricky Martin, that was uh, SGPS show rig in, in Las Vegas. So I would go to the shop and um, you read into kind of the plans. Usually the, the guys in the shop have already prepared some of the machines like they get out of, a lot of the things are just rentals. So they will mm -hmm. get, storage and they'll get tested by the guys in the shop to make sure they all work uh and then like the, the automation team together like the crew chief me and uh the techs that work on it will build it uh in the shop how it's supposed to be on tour mm -hmm. and then um i'll set up my rig and make sure that everything works you test it you break it you try to purposely like test it yeah. slim so you know like what it can do uh mm -hmm. i'll get information from the guys in the shop if they have it like what's the maximum load it can it can carry uh how fast does it go uh what are limitations is there anything you can or can't do with it like you try to figure out as much information as you can and you try to figure out how you fix things like what are the things that could easily break on tour uh do we have spare parts for it you try to prep everything like that already at home so that by the moment you load in for the first real show rehearsals where everybody comes together that um you can start working with the with the whole team on um on the show design the specific mm -hmm. design for that tour um yeah. and that's usually somewhere between like a week and three weeks that we do rehearsals in a in an arena or in a, a rehearsal site with the whole with the whole crew mm -hmm. and at That's the shop so like two weeks or so that we have mm -hmm. the equipment yeah. 
That's amazing. So you first like think about like, um, I, I find it interesting that you try to break it. So it's so, so you know the limit, right? Right. Well, yeah. And with break it, I mean, I try to make it fault. So I yeah. try to go too fast, you know, like, and, and mm -hmm. say, like, oh, this machine can go three feet per second. I'm going to make it go three and a half feet per second. And if it faults, I know that's the limit. I, I can't go faster than that. Um, mm -hmm. So you try to, to, yeah, just, just find its limits and make sure that, uh, that the brakes work, the stops work, the end stops. If you have a track and you run it into the end of it, that those stops mm -hmm. will actually hold it if, you, if it comes to it. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I find it so interesting and so um, amazing. Like, uh, cause they, like I, I've never actually had anyone in the show who was um, into into automation, into this kind of like this field inside a tour, and I find it so fundamental, like so key. Like you guys do, like thanks to your team, you guys do incredible like shows, and the audiences just go home like as happy as they as happier than than ever. So yeah, I really so, love it. I love the effects that we can do. And I just, I love the equipment. I love working on like, it's a, a little bit of electrical engineering too. Uh, I love to know how things work. I'm always very curious. Uh, I've had a lot of training on the job to, to learn everything. I think you can learn as much as you want, as long as you, you find resources to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I've done a lot of training with Tate in, uh, in Pennsylvania, they're in Lidditz. They're one of the biggest staging companies in the world. Um, they have very advanced technology. Um, it's very interesting to do training with them. I, I think that a lot. Um, actually, Jake introduced me to one of the guys there, uh, Aaron Siebert. He um, he is the production uh, the, the project manager there for all the the big tours, and he introduced me to uh, Geronimo Carby, who is the um, the education, the trainer there for automation. And uh, I've done uh, like a, a couple of weeks of training with them. And it was so interesting to see how they build drives, how everything works, how everything is connected, how, mm -hmm. how machines actually work and how mm -hmm. they are controlled because they have a different software than um, we used at Brilliant Stages or uh, with uh, SGPS Show Rig. They have their own uh, software, which is called Navigator, and it's very mm -hmm. advanced. It's very interesting. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I've been very lucky to have all these opportunities and <laughs> to meet these incredible people that have just helped me, uh, like, do all this. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. And um, well, I, I I wanted to ask you a bit about um, like the how how do you say this? So like you um. Look, you, you work with almost like a really, like you, you work with loads of departments, like different departments. You have to be in touch with, uh, with lights, with sound, with, um, with even costumes, I guess, because you guys have to like adapt. The, I think I, because I had some costumes people over and they explained me how they adapt the costumes uh, for them to have like these safety pins and all of that uh, for when they are flying or for when they are like on top of something. So you have to work with loads of different departments. And um, what's probably like the most useful skill that someone uh, who wants to start, like who wants to start uh, in working uh, in, in automation can have? I think people skills are honestly the best thing you can have. Um, mm -hmm. If you help someone else out, they'll help you out if you need it. So, because we work with so many different departments, it really helps to have friends in every department because there's going to be this one day where you're stuck loading out or loading in and someone else is already done. And they're like, you know what? I'll give you a hand because the other day, you know, I was in trouble and you helped me out. So mm -hmm. I think even like people skills beyond anything else is probably the most important thing to have just because you're so dependent on other people. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a teamwork, I guess. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. 
I, I I find it I find it so I I find it amazing that uh, like um, I guess I really like people in general. <laughs> I like working with people. I like talking to people. I like everything. So uh, that's why I think that's one of the reasons why I I find um, touring so like amazing because you get to work with so many different people, so many different fields, and and even if you're probably not having a, a good day, people are gonna try and cheer you up and and say that's fine don't worry we have this like you've you've got this things like that i don't know <laughs> i haven't actually gone i haven't actually gone on tour yet i want to okay. but covid came <laughs> so for now i'm waiting but <laughs> someday you someday close to everybody on the crew like uh automation we're usually first in last out we're in with the riggers and everybody because a lot of our stuff is in the air and we're last out because we're rigging Yeah. Um, so everything yeah. comes out last too. Um, but we have things on the stage here. You work with carpenters, you work with the lighting, like on the Ricky tour, I had a lot of lighting in, in some of my, uh, my scenery, uh, things in the air. And so you work with everybody. Mm -hmm. That's just the thing that makes it so cool. Um, which is actually also why I changed my mind of being in production versus, uh, mm -hmm. something different. Uh, I figured out that, um, being in, in a production you're mostly in an office and i enjoy being out there i enjoy mm -hmm. working partly with my hands and partly having that uh intellectual challenge of trying to get you know the yeah. visualized what the designers want to see to transfer that into the machines actually doing what they yeah. envision and mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to build cues and how to make them Yeah, how to make the machines do something cool. Yeah, no, definitely. You're literally in front of house. So you said it before. So <laughs> you're in front of everything with everyone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How do you... So cool. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you uh, do with uh, wake, waking up super early, going to bed super late? Where, when do you sleep, more or less? I, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. you don't sleep ah that that's for mortals that's for mortals exactly <laughs> I swear there i always say that like there is some kind of chip that they hide in like my radio or something as soon as i step away from front of house someone will call me on the radio and go like hey mimi can you move this thing for a minute and <laughs> you go like <laughs> i was just about to have lunch but i guess i'm not gonna have lunch i'll move this and yeah. <laughs> Got yelled at um, last year uh, by the production manager Chris Gratton for uh, he's usually for Justin Bieber. We were on the road with Jay Balvin, and um, and he yelled at me that I always skipped lunch because there was always someone else that was ready for like automation. And um, one day I remember sitting and catering with him, and I told him about it. He was like, "You just need to say no." And I was like, "Well, it's hard, you know. You want to help out. You don't want to delay someone else by saying that you're going for lunch." I always just skipped everything and worked through the whole day and I was sitting next to him for lunch and again I just sit down my plate and someone goes hey Mimi can you come move something and he looks at me and he goes like and I was like ah uh, give me 10 minutes I'll be right there and he was like <laughs> and I was like <laughs> <laughs> I bet that if he wasn't there You would have been like, yeah, a minute, I'm in, in a minute I'm there. I would take my plate and just go to my desk, like with my plate, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's something that's like, there's always something to do. And you just, yeah, automation, you, because like at the end of the day, you still need to test your equipment. Like it's always, there's, it's never ending. There's always something you can do or improve or uh, get yeah. better for like a, a next load in or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of there's always something going on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, but it's true. It's true that you need to eat from the moment the doors open until the show. Yeah, it's fine if you don't sleep, but you need to eat. <laughs> exactly. <A> coffee gets <laughs> a lot. <laughs> true. True. <laughs> Well, and I wanted to ask you, because sometimes um, when you are, uh, so when you're preparing um, for uh, going into rehearsal, so you're preparing all the material and everything, um, sometimes you, you like, I guess the stage designers or something, they come to you with requests. And what happens if that request is really crazy, is not going to work, is really dangerous? Like, how do you communicate with them? Like, yeah, we cannot do this. 
like do you give any other option or or what happens well it usually it usually only happens when you're actually at the rehearsal site so when i test my equipment at home i don't know what they want to see i don't know anything about their effects i don't know any of the songs they're going to do or like that all starts when you're actually on site so the first thing i try to do is get some kind of ideas of what they are planning to see so i can uh, cue some moves uh, to just show them what the machines can do so they can ask what they uh, what they want to see but obviously there's always these things that you never expect them to ask or something super dangerous um, of course you try to find a solution together to make it a safe move um, to try to find options that either you, you have someone sign a waiver like we've had artists sign a waiver because they didn't want to have handrails on a certain lift that would go very high and we would be like well if you fall off that's a big danger because there's audience down there so if you fall on top of the audience someone could get hurt you could get hurt we don't think this is safe we want handrails and they would go like for a cosmetic kind of view we don't like handrails so you have them sign something that they understand the risks and um that they basically sign their life away if they fall off something happens it's on it's on them yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. if it's something that the lift can do um it can't go faster for example they go like oh we need something that goes twice as fast and you go like well the lift just can't like this is as fast as it goes uh if they really want that then i start talking to the people at home in the, in the shop saying like hey is there another lift that we can get out here or a different kind of motor um mm -hmm can we modify this lift so it can go faster or can we just swap it out for something else um and then you talk to them about costs and the production manager gets involved um, when it's actually if they want to change the equipment so you always try to find solutions but there's always been moments especially in the beginning of rehearsals when all these things kind of come flying at you and you have no idea that that's what they wanted to do like oh we have this lift can we have 15 people dancing on it at 20 feet high and you're like no yeah and they're well <laughs> what we what we plan for and you're like no so <laughs> and then they yell at you because that's like ah oh, this is what we designed we want this and i'm like well the lift can't carry that many people dancing so that's not safe um yeah. and then you start to negotiate like maybe we can do half of those people and you're like all right mm. we can do those people and i talk to the shop at home like is this safe like or do you guys agree and i'll have someone in a higher level than me write me an email saying like yes this is acceptable let's do this that way you have kind of a shared responsibility and that's the kind of support you have all over like uh production managers like Faye, they will always have my back uh if it yeah. comes to safety like if i say this is not safe for a certain reason he might not like it but he will back me up to production designers or something mm -hmm. else and that's the same with the people in the shop at home uh if we don't feel it's safe if everybody agrees on that then you have that kind of support behind you yeah. so you're never alone like even if it's um or you know i can even ask like fellow operators like i have mm -hmm. this issue what do you think is this a safe move uh, what would you do if you were the operator on the show and everybody is very supportive so that really helps making the right decisions and sometimes you'll have to tell people like all right we have three weeks of rehearsals let's give it two days to figure this out and then we'll do it after that mm -hmm. yeah yeah no sometimes it's, it's good to ask for double advice because sometimes maybe you think that it's maybe you think it's dangerous but another person says oh maybe well maybe it's not so dangerous if we do it this way or another way and then you're like oh okay they give you like another perspective exactly and, yeah mm -hmm. yeah and i think i think that's that's very useful and i wanted to ask you because i remember this um tour the tour of Kanye west the one that goes like that stage that flies up and down i don't know if if you've seen it that it doesn't have handrails do you think that they made him sign that <laughs> Maybe. i mean we had a moving stage on beyonce um and for her the deal was that if it was just her and jay-z uh there were no handrails because they didn't like it but as soon as there were dancers on there uh they were handrails so they came to that kind of agreement um 
it's understandable that the artists are responsible for their own moves. If they don't want that, that's fine. But for dancers, you can't ask a dancer to, set, to sign their uh, responsibility yeah. away. So, um, so yeah, you come to agreements like that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's cool. Um, I, I really I really found that stage really amazing. But it's true that uh, it gives me vertigo for some reason. I'm like, I don't know how I would go like up there to sing for two hours. I think I'm fine in here. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's sick. One, one lift on J Balvin uh, like a year and a half ago, two years ago. And uh, it was 20 feet up in the air and it was very small. It was like just the, like, like a, a square. A like yeah it was a circle it was very small it had handrails obviously okay. and everybody who was on there the first time they're like i'll go on there because i had to test it every day so i would get like a volunteer from the crew like, <laughs> or like someone else like you want to go on the lift like i need to test it with someone on it they'd be like yeah sure and everybody was like super cool like the first like five ten feet and then it would go higher and it was pretty wiggly because it's so high and thin uh oh, wow. i'm mean, safe but you know you feel that it's a little wiggly everybody would grab onto those handrails like, after a while yeah <laughs> and they were like, oh yeah i'll go up whatever you know and then someplace like <laughs> <laughs> well if we ever if we ever go on tour i want to be a volunteer please. yes <laughs> you can be my guinea pig for testing for sure <laughs> let's do it <laughs> I like that expression of like, okay, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> that, that, I, the good thing is, <laughs> the good thing is that on those kind of tours, there's like 500 people, so you have 500 volunteers. That's fine. <laughs> exactly. That's like the only time where I said to like, uh, because J Balvin wasn't there for rehearsals. Um, he was. He only showed up for the first show. And I actually made him go up that lift before the show because I was like, if he gets scared during that show going up for the first time, uh, like that's, <laughs> I don't know what to do. You know, if he goes like, bring me down. <laughs> <laughs> he would be like, like singing, I don't know, whatever song. And then he would be looking at you like <laughs> at the same time he's singing. So we had him go up like before the show in the afternoon. And he was he was okay with it, but he was kind of happy. I think that he tried it at least once before the show because it was oh, yeah. so high and and kind of wiggly. Yeah, so. yeah, definitely. Well, at least we, it was not a windy day. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh well. So um, I wanted to ask you something about. Uh, um, well, probably, yeah, now that we're talking about wiggly things and, and crazy stuff that you've done and all of that, I wanted to ask you, like, what's probably the craziest automation thing you've ever done? Like, one of these things that you're like, okay, like, this, this, this is gonna, this is mad. <laughs> well, funny enough, it's not necessarily a crazy machine. It was more that um, it was the, the mentality of the people it was more like a, let's let's wing it everything was let's wing it and it was an awesome crew i love those people it was on the j balvin tour and um, but they freaked me out every now and then because uh, there would be guest artists that were not announced before and like halfway through the show you go like oh whatever someone's coming up on the lift oh but we haven't programmed it he's never been on the lift like what when oh we don't know yet probably like early this song and you'd be like what but guests so, like like artists and things like that yeah and it's like oh we'll wing it because normally everything is programmed oh, wow. so yeah. i know like time coded when everything is moving so mm -hmm. my spotters who are uh the rest of the the crew usually they will tell me uh it's clear to move the artist is loaded um yeah. you know everything is safe they will they'll keep me posted the lift is clear um so i have people that look at it but if there is unprogrammed things, these spotters might be smoking outside or getting a glass of water from catering. Because if there's like two songs where they have no cues, there's no reason for them to stay next to that lift because I have other things moving with other spotters, but that specific person doesn't have to be there every mm -hmm. single second. But if you have unplanned things, you have to get make sure that it still happens safely. So mm -hmm. I think the, the craziest one was when we were in uh, Colombia and we had a huge stadium show. It was a four hour long show. 
The only thing I had was the lift on that show because it was a stadium. Everything else used to be rigged. So I just had that one lift, but nothing was programmed. Everything was just on the go. Like, all right, go. <laughs> what? <laughs> Whoa. So it's, um, yeah, it's not always the safest thing to do, but we made it safe. We had a lot of people on site. It was definitely more stressful not knowing when things are going to move and, mm -hmm. uh, there, I had no cameras anywhere on that show. Like usually I like to have some safety cameras. Mm. Uh, so even though I have spotters, like if someone uh, is late saying something or uh, something happens, I can always see what's going on. I can see yeah. the artist is on there. So I'll still wait for the, yes, it's safe. Artist is loaded from my spotter, but I can also see it, which is kind of nice to have the double, mm. uh, double safety basically. Double safety. <laughs> Think safe. So yeah. <laughs> uh, not having any of that for uh, some of the shows was uh, was definitely interesting and a little more stressful than it usually is, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Because you don't know, like normally you said you have a program, so you know exactly the time, exactly the minute, exactly the yeah. second. Yeah. And, and then you come in a show where like you don't know who like what guests you're having because sometimes they have guests from outside of the tour yeah. and they don't know what kind of lifts they don't know what kind of rigging they don't know anything and yeah. and you're like okay so so okay i'll, I'll just press the bottom <laughs> exactly. they say yes. like, oh yeah they're gonna come up or it's like oh are they gonna come down on the lift too at the end of the song oh we don't know yet and you're like okay so everybody like stay there and then you try to look what those people are doing and mm -hmm. I try to talk to yeah. them. If you have a second, you know, like I would make signs by the lift. So if we had a lot of um, guest artists that I, because I always go through how to use a lift with the artist in your rehearsals, just to make sure that they know what safety protocols we have. So for example, if a lift stops working, that they don't start climbing off until they have like a, a green light for that, or that we know it's going to happen. So they don't, mm -hmm to climb off a moving lift or something like that yeah so it's always like you don't get that chance with a lot of guest artists so i would make signs and make sure that everybody still was able to use the equipment safely you're frozen yeah I hello i yeah. i think i lost you okay i'm sorry <laughs> Okay, are you, can you can you see me and hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, sorry. What were you saying? I lost you uh, when you were talking about um like uh, yeah, you're you're like like a couple minutes ago. Okay, so guest artists. That's was something that Yes, there you go. Yeah. That's something that I always have time with the artist to go through safety protocols during rehearsals so I was like it only takes maybe five minutes but we'll go through all the automation so they know what's going to happen they know how it moves uh, they know what to do when something stops working during the show um, like we'll always have rescue plans like very tall ladders or other uh, ways of rescuing someone from a from a, a lift or a performer flying or anything like that I want to have people know what they can expect Guest artists, not so much because they're only there for that one show. Um, so I often don't even get to talk to them. So if I know I have guest artists, I make signs by the, by the equipment so that they can still read it before they get on. Um, so that way I still have some kind of safety in place for, uh, for the use for, for guests. Yeah. Yeah, that's really that's a really good idea to have like these kind of read stuff. Sometimes they cannot read it, but that's not your fault. That's fine. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I was so to make anyway, it like fun. So it's kind of like it's safe. You have to read it, but I'm also just trying to be cool about it. Yeah, maybe with emojis or something like you can put like the dead emoji if do the, this kind of emoji, you know. <laughs> yeah, that would be a good idea. I should do that. I should use some emojis. <laughs> Hi. Anyway, so I wanted to talk about uh, before we before we finish the call. I wanted to talk a bit about 
the future. So um, what do you see like in the next few months, in the next few years because of COVID? How do you think automation is going to change? Is it going to affect uh, the show, the COVID in that sense? Um, I hope that we can get back on tour. For now, my tour is still scheduled to be on in September in the United States uh, with Ricky Martin and Enrique Iglesias. Um, I hope that's still going to happen. Um, Fauci here is pretty optimistic of getting herd immunity by end of July. Um, mm -hmm. I know some of the ticket companies have already started integrating apps in the phone where you can uh, either prove that you're vaccinated or show a negative COVID test. I think that's going to be huge for, uh, for venues. Um, mm -hmm. I think as people will go because everybody is sick of staying at home. And um, I know that people, as soon as they are allowed to, they will try to go to concerts. So I'm not worried about people not coming. I'm more worried about being able to do it safely. Um, yeah. I wouldn't want to be on a tour with the risk that the crew is going to get sick and, and something bad might happen. Um, mm. So I hope we can all do it safely. I hope we can um, get herd immunity um and yeah so I, I don't think automation necessarily is going to get affected i think that's going to be the same as it's been the last few years i just think that shows in general are going to change for sure mm -hmm. definitely yeah and uh well i think i only have uh, probably one question left okay. uh yeah I, I, it's been it's been a pleasure really i love talking to you and Faye is right you are incredibly nice and and super oh, cute thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well my last question is um where do you see yourself in one year hopefully on tour again <laughs> yeah. i can't wait i miss it so much um, I was listening to a podcast um, uh, with Bill Body, who was the production manager for our Beyonce and he's fresh for Coldplay. And he mentioned that he said the moment he misses most is the moment where it goes house lights go, where the house lights go out, like the moment, like right before the show. And that made me miss it so much, like hearing him say that, I was like, that's exactly the moment I miss most too. It's like that moment where you've built the whole show you hear on your comms, like house lights go. And that's just the moment the show starts. That's, yeah, that's something I really miss. So I hope I'll be on tour in a year and be able to hear that again. Yeah. Oh, I think, I think I lost you there. Wait, yes. are you are you there? Yes. Okay, yeah. sorry. I lost you that that last second. Yeah. <laughs> um but yeah, I think I think that moment of uh, lights lights the house lights go that's probably the moment. And and the screams, you know, like not the yes. screams and the claps and the and the spectation and and the first intro, the intro the the intro that they put at the beginning and everything. That's I think that's insane. That feeling. I miss it a lot. <laughs> I totally agree. And that's the moment I miss most too. Like is everybody has been waiting for that moment and uh, everything comes together, all the departments, the whole crew, the audience, the artists, like that's, yeah, that's mm -hmm. probably the most magical moment. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Mimi. I hope you have a really lovely Saturday. <laughs> so much. Thank you for having me. It's so cool. I hope you keep going and get more incredible people on your show. That's really awesome. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, well, I hope you have a really lovely day and thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. You again. <laughs>